Thanks for having me here. And as I was standing outside thinking about what I was going to say, I heard somebody come in and say, hey, is that the airplane guy up there when Russ was sitting up here? And I realized that I prepared a talk that like completely jumped over what the hell we do at beta. So I'm going to take like one minute for those aren't familiar with, uh, with what our, and that was you over here, the airplane talk guy. Um, the, uh, what we're doing at Beta is um, we're, we're designing and building electric airplanes. Uh, the transportation as a whole um, has gone, at least on the technological forward end of it, electric on ferries, on uh, locomotives long ago. We see cars, now trucking's going in electric. And if we don't do anything about aviation, it will be the largest producer of CO2 emissions in all transportation by 2035. And aviation, specifically airplanes within aviation, has a very long life cycle. And if we want to hit our climate pledges of 2030, 2035, 2040, we have to do something about it now. Because the development cycle, the launch cycle, the deployment, the planes that are getting sold today are still going to be flying in 2040. So our customers are thinking today, how do I get ahead of that to put something, get something on order now so that I can solve the problem that I know I need to solve we talked about the social pressures. We have a thesis around social regulation at the company. And this is the last thing I'll say about the business, but it'll explain a little bit why we've been so fortunate um, to have uh, investors back us, have an amazing group of technologists come and join the company, and customers get ahead of us. It's the fact that there's, there's you know, flat growth. There's companies that die. There's linear growth year over year. There's exponential growth, and then there's vertical growth. And that vertical growth, um, is really only seen in areas where there's a regulatory change. And the regulatory change that we believe is coming is a social regulation. I heard somebody in an earlier talk talking about packaging. And if I got a component in 10 years wrapped up in plastic, how disgusted I may be as a consumer. Well, in the future, we're hoping that if you push order on Amazon or UPS or some e-commerce reseller, and your goods come to you in a gas-powered plane, and you have this cognizance of what your environmental impact is because of what you just caused to be shipped to your house, you say, whoa, there's plenty of technology out there in electric aircraft and net zero operational aircraft. Why, what, why didn't you choose to do that? I'm shopping somewhere else. And that social regulation will be like the regulation, and I think Martine and I talked about that up here not too long ago, like the regulation uh, that, that people are just completely intolerable of companies that, that tolerate racism or misogyny or, or, or sexism. And in the future, it's like, hey, what are you doing to the planet? What are you thinking? And, and the goal here is to get to the point where we have a technically viable product so that people can think like that. Because if there's no technically viable product, people won't think like that. They're like, oh, it is what it is. That's the way it gets here. So with that, um, we're building electric airplanes. But in order to build electric airplanes, we have to create an organization of innovation. And in this specific talk, the concept of leading from behind is one of, what, of three key concepts that we kind of leverage within the business. And, and, and I, I thought about this, why do we lead from behind? What's the concept behind it? What is the, what is the purpose? And it's because we want to develop an organization of innovation. And when we do that, we break it up into kind of two big buckets. There's the cultural aspects of creating an environment for it. Uh, for, for innovation, and then there's the mechanisms and all the tools within the strategy to create innovation. And on the cultural side, it really starts, and I'll talk about this in detail, with defining what you're after, what's your mission as a business. And, uh, and our mission as a generation, as we've talked about a lot in the Sea Change sessions, is to turn the corner on climate change. It's a huge threat to, our, to, our, to everybody here, and it's something that's meaningful enough to go after with uh, kind of un unprecedented uh, uh, tenacity. So our mission is to do that within aviation and decarbonize aviation, and that's pretty simple. The next is, is to create a culture where people share common passions. And even this whole concept of leading from behind means nothing unless you have people that are looking in the same direction. So within our company, when people come there, um, I screen them for, or anybody does at this point, everybody within the company, how much do they care about aviation? How much do they care about technology and have an insatiable curiosity? And how much do they care about sustainability? And the, and, the, and the general rule is you don't get in the door unless you at least have two of those passions. And mathematically, if everybody has two of those passions, then every one person in the company will share at least one common passion with somebody else. 
And then we foster and educate people to have the third passion. We give them the opportunity to fly. We talk about sustainability. We act like the companies that we're trying to sell airplanes to. And we get them access to really neat technologies and expose them to smart people. So hopefully they pick up those passions. Um, a lot of behaviors that I'll talk about uh, in a minute, things like walking into a meeting and just assuming you're wrong, just starting with the assumption that you're wrong and, and listening first and assuming or making the, the cognitive kind of connection that just because they're doing something different, maybe, maybe it's not wrong because I had a mental inertia in the other direction. And, and that's a part of how you get to the point of leading from behind and, and having a clear purpose on what you're doing. And I don't think I need to explain that. On the strategy side, we'll talk about one of the mechanisms here to, to get there. So we, we are a very simple company, and that'll be a subject of a different talk that, we, uh, that, that I go after. But today, talking about the first principles of building a company. You have the team, technology, and a market. And just breaking it down the way that an engineer thinks about it is that in the context of the team, let's say we've chosen something worthwhile to go after, and, uh, and the market agrees with it, and everything else agrees with it. What, what is execution risk? It's the ratio of how, many, how much resources you put in by the work that you get out, or sort of the work you get out over the resources you put in. And that's your net efficiency. And, and any place that you have churn, that you have misdirection, that people are going off in the wrong direction, is affecting your ability to execute. We're never perfect. There's going to be places where we screw it up. But the way that I think about execution risk is efficiency. And I'll get back to that in a second. On technology, it's, it's actually pretty simple. Mother Nature gives us physics to work within. And we give ourselves this ever-increasing level of technology, whether it be how fast semiconductors can go, uh, how, how power-dense batteries or energy-dense batteries are. All these technology things are being developed by thousands and thousands of engineers and manufacturing techs and, and artists. And they're putting this all together to a technology set at any point in that continuum to deliver to the next layer up. So we get this technology set to, to work with. In our case, the big ones are like batteries, material systems, uh, semiconductors, control systems. And we cross that with Mother Nature. And we say, OK, if we take the maximum maximorum of what we can achieve with, the, with, with physics and technology, then we can, we can objectively say today that we have, we have bested the technology opportunity for our business. And the last one, which is a little bit unique, and I don't think a lot of people think about, is, is if we think about the business net efficiency, we can spend a boatload of dough on marketing, a whole, lot of a whole lot of money trying to convince people to see our company the way we want them to see it. And we think about it a little bit differently. How about if we just make the company transparent and just let people see what we've already done? And it's, it's phase shifts, and it makes you look a little bit slower than everybody else, but it's hyper-efficient. Like, you walk in the front door to our, our building now, you look straight down to a motor lab, you look left to a simulator, and you look right into a 3D printing lab. There's no marketing. There's no, like, fancy TVs spouting out the next thing we're going to do or a marketing campaign or a big slogan. You just see the stuff that's going on, and it turns out it's really damn interesting. And so the same thing's true when we think about communicating to the outside world. What do we do when we share things? We simply share a picture. We don't share a CGI or a photo rendering of things. We share a picture of what we've done. And we say, hey, we just flew right across this lake. Locky right here. Where the hell did he go? Right back here. It's up here flying right over there this morning. Like, that's damn good marketing. We didn't have to make a video or anything. He just did it. And nice job, Locky. <laughs> One more day, you didn't crash a plane. Oh. The, uh, the, the uh, and, and what are the numbers? I think we threw 500 miles in the last couple of days over there or something. Like, the, the, that, that's real good, like, solid, genuine stuff. And it makes super efficient use of capital because we don't have to generate marketing campaigns and all kinds of crazy stuff around it. So starting with the first principle of engineering, and how do we apply that? So now we have this concept of being really efficient as a team. Um, and the two areas that we're going to talk about is how we define what we can do set that goal, and then lead from behind to achieve that goal. So that's kind of the structure of what we're going to talk about. So in engineering, every problem, and even really complex problems like building an entirely new class of aircraft that has wildly different control systems that have ever been certified in an aircraft, different propulsion systems, new forms of batteries that are adopted and have to 
handle crashworthiness and extreme cold, extreme hot, even a really complex problem. And I would argue that this is on the complexer end of complexity continuums. You can still break it down to something really, really simple. We're not building a nuclear power plant, but it's not that far off. So the first, the first thing that we look at within an airplane is called empty weight fraction. This is just an example, but you can probably apply it to whatever business you're doing. Break your problem down into the very, very simplest things. And at the end of this, you'll see, and I'm going to re repeat it then, make sure those things are linearly tradable. You put them into units that you can say, if I have 10 of these versus one of these, that's parity. So if I have two of these, that's better than 10 of these. And it can be dollars, it can be pounds, it can be whatever your, 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 your metric is. So empty weight fraction. So make the airplane light. Make the airplane slippery. So that's Newton's a drag. But it turns out weight and Newton's a drag can be linearly tra tradable. You carry a lot of energy, and you convert that precious energy really efficiently into propulsion. That's it. That's how you make an airplane go a long ways. It's, it's really not complicated. But the secret there is that you make them linearly tradable. And then to other factors like economics, how, much, how many dollars per pound? The guy behind you. How much? He says over ten. Eight thousand dollars a pound is metric that everybody in the company knows. Eight thousand dollars a pound. They know I can save one pound. It's eight thousand bucks. Good. That's linearly tradable. We know that x newtons a drag equals one pound. We also know that twelve pounds equals one mile of range. And and as you as you work through all this stuff, when we get into a debate, is like. Hey, should we make the, 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 this, this fairing a little slipperier? It's going to weigh a little bit more. We can simply trade it under those metrics. And, and I would argue that most all businesses, you can lay that down and you can figure out the time value of money, for example, in an economic business and determine if investments are returning what you attempted to return over here. And all of a sudden, you have a linearly tradable thing between two different returns because we have this DCF or discounted cash flow model with totally different return schedules. So, this is how we linearly trade these dimensions. And it looks like a lot of math, but it's really, really simple. It's you, Mother Nature gave you gravity. You've got some slipperiness to a plane. You convert your precious energy, like I said, uh, at a particular rate. So if you've got a megawatt hour of batteries, how much of that megawatt hour can you push out the back so airplane go forward? Of the total aircraft itself, which you know how much it weighs, how much battery can you get on it? And then of that battery, how much energy is in it? And by the way, just as a neat little fact, when, when we look at the specific energy density of batteries, so the amount of energy per unit mass, we, we, we typically think of watt hours per kilogram. We compare that to something like jet A or diesel fuel. We have about a 30 times, 30 times difference. But when we think about converting it, we have about a three times benefit. So now we have a 10 to 1 detriment over traditional aircraft in how much energy we can actually push out the back per pound we're carrying in an airplane. So rest assured, it's really important we make a slippery and light aircraft, just like a Tesla, right? If you took a, a big battery and a motor and went and shoved it into a Land Rover, would you have a commercially viable car? Probably not. Not in the way that a Tesla is because people have range anxiety, right? So what do you do? You make the, 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 the handles flush with the door. The underbelly has three arrow, uh, arrow um, covers so that you have a really slippery underside of the car. And the entire car is designed to be very, very aerodynamic because that precious energy can't be pissed away pushing air down the highway. So when you cross all those things together, you get to what Mother Nature said you can do and what the level of technology, and it turns out that we have, a, we have the level of technology in Mother Nature to do 250 nautical miles of range, do it at 105 knots. This is maximum, maximum. Remember, we can never quite get to this, but that's where we, th we think we can get with, uh, with infinite time down the scope of innovation. And, uh, and another important parameter for our customers, turns out, is how quickly you can recharge it. Because if you're using the aircraft to deliver packages, you have to recharge it pretty quick. Well, it turns out that it's not only always the most efficient thing, and this is, again, going back to example, to simply define that and just run after it. There's, there's certain things that you just don't understand how to implement appropriately. So the first thing we did as a company, we said, 
we wrote a contract with our first customer, and, and, and the, the, the objective of the entire contract was to elicit critical thinking about electric aviation. And you'll see an analogy of climbing a hill as a team later on. Eliciting critical thinking starts to lay the groundwork and the map on how you're going to go up the hill, what choices you're going to make when you get to different corners, what foundational assumptions you're going to make when you make commitments to customers. So we went and built this ugly machine, as dubbed in Wired Magazine, as the Edward Scissorhands of flying cars. <laughs> and, and basically, it has eight rotors, four, uh, two layers of four rotors that each turn in a different direction, and then the bottom rotors turn in the opposite direction of the top rotor on each corner. And then all four of those uh, corners thrust vector forward, which means they start pointing upward, and as you accelerate the aircraft, they fly forward, so then you get on the wing and you fly away like a normal airplane. Really neat, seemingly simple. You've got this like synchronous motion and a big wing, Turns out it's really not the most simple way to do it. And the devil's in the details here, which is those motors are spinning pretty fast. They've got a gearbox or a belt reduction drive. They have liquid cooling that has to circulate through there, which means there's another pump pumping the fluid into the motor. But when you go and build it and you fly it and you learn this stuff, you learn the best path up the mountain. And it turns out that this is much closer to the best path. It's not the best path, but this is what Lockheed was flying this morning over the lake here, this exact one. So back to like, once we established with the maximum maximum and we said we can actually get to a particular goal. Let me see if this goes. I'll narrate. No, I won't. <laughs> um, something about like United From Therapeutics. From one place to another. If, if they're when we make online, an organ, it has I to apologize. be used within hours, like it's at really the outset, 12 hours. The only practical way to get the product to the patient who needs it is by flying. As we continue to help more and more people with uh, organ transplants, it has to be gotten there by flight. And if we do this all with regular aircraft, we're going to be making a humongous carbon footprint. So what Martine does, and you missed the beginning of that, is, makes, is making an unlimited supply of organs. Um, there are about 800,000 people who need organs. There's about 100,000 people in the organ waiting list, and there's about 8,000 transplants a year. And unquestionably, there's people in this room who have loved ones that have needed an organ. And it turns out it's quite important that those organs move pretty quickly and that they move the transplant surgeon if necessary, the crews. And in other cases, in the case that they're using it now, they actually are repairing organs, and they're flying twice as many times in order to repair organs. And, uh, and she doesn't want to do that while you're destroying the environment. And really simply, like we're going to go and save a few people's lives with, with lungs, with, with an unlimited supply of lungs. When I say a few people, a small percentage, it's a lot of people. But that shouldn't be at the expense uh, of, of our climate running away in 50 years. That's the simple, simple premise behind using, using electric, electric aviation. So with a very small team doing things in a really simple way, and like I talked about before in that aircraft, what, one of our objective was, again, to elicit critical thinking and determine what that maximum maximorum. So here we go talking about leading from behind. The first step in leading from behind, in my opinion, is to have a very clear and art articulable goal that you're going after. It has to be nominally provable, probably 70% reality and 25% aspirational. And we've got to be able to look at that goal and say, that's where we're going. Hey, Chuck. I see you back there. Um, the, uh, you, you see that goal, and you, and you, can, you can grab onto your buddy in, in 30 seconds. Say we're going 250 miles, 105 knots, charging less than an hour. And, uh, and they're like, oh, I get it. That's pretty simple. It's pretty simple. And remember, you're building a team here. And, and one of the reasons that, that you, you do this is because um, you now have said to this person right here, we're, we're at the same level. We're standing next to each other. And I think I'm going to stop for one second and say something that I've, I think I've realized, and we talk about it a lot within our company, that the relationship between employees and companies is different now than it was in the past. That's not super insightful, but let me tell you why, why I think it's different. And the way that I describe it is that the, the, the way 
that you and, or not you as in, because you're not employees of beta, but the way that you could think about your relationship with the company is that this is just a massive trade between me and the company. I know that if this company is going to grow and amass more, more value and talent and people and do more good, the trade has to be a little bit bent towards the company. But maybe not, because my perception of what I receive at it could be pretty darn good. And that company consists of a whole lot of people. And if you apply that thinking that my trade is, what do I give to this group of people and what do I take from this group of people, and I got to give a little bit more than I take, then the whole thing gets bigger and better. And, and, and where that becomes powerful is things like you know, taking vacation. Like, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, then I'm going to balance that vacation. We don't have a vacation policy. You take as much time as you want. As long as you look around your colleagues and say, hey, am I leaving you high and dry? Okay, I'm not good. I'm out of here. And they should give you a high five and say, you deserve that. Go for it. See you later. Have a great time. Send me some pictures. The, th that mentality only exists when people think like that. The second, the second example is like our expense policy. There's, there isn't a case where people have to go, oh, I'm going to go get my manager to approve my purchase of the latest Adobe software or whatever you're buying it's an oscilloscope or whatever. Everybody's going to look in the mirror and say, OK, if I'm thinking about this like a big trade between me and the company, what am I getting out of this? How am I being more productive? I think like an entrepreneur. And when there are big expenses, I say, geez, I, don't, I, I walked into this meeting, like I said before, and I don't know everything. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm going to grab a colleague, and I'm going to say, hey, um, I've been thinking about buying the $75,000 oscilloscope. Here's what it does. Here's how I expect it. What do you think about buying it? And if they're like, yo, that makes sense, then you go and buy it. And the, the game is, is that if, if somebody's re, you know, uh, retroactively reviewing the expenses and they come down and they say, hey, what was this all about? You say, hey, with the information I had at the time, I made this decision, and it was for the best interest of the company because I thought about it like this. They're like, done. OK, it may have been the wrong decision, but they made the decision in a, in a very intelligent way. The alternative is that you come down to that person. You say, hey, why did you play, buy this oscilloscope for 50000 bucks?" They said, oh, well, I got approval from somebody that doesn't know what the hell I'm doing most of the time, that drops in once a week, doesn't really know where my pain points and problems are, but they're smarter than me because they're in front of me. So one way of leading from behind is getting behind the people by giving them that empowerment. So you, get, you put your arm around the first person, you identify the goal, they get to tell the other people what the goal is very easily, and there's no confusion. And then what do you do? So down in the bottom there, the leader, you take a big step back, and you get out of the way. You hired a bunch of smart people, and then you just get the F out of the way. Now, they are on the front lines, and they're running up this hill to the goal, and there's hurdles, there's black holes, there's sharpie things, there's snipers in the woods. You know where some of those things are because you experimented and you kind of identified the goal, but you got behind everybody. And, and that's what, in my opinion, leading from behind is. It's, it's getting behind them. And, and, and you look around, and you're not plugging dikes. I hate that analogy. You're not shoving your finger into holes or whatever. But you're just finding the place where, where the, the business isn't moving quite, quite fast enough. And sometimes you step up, and you're like, oh, the plane needs washing. I'm going to wash the plane. I'm not going to do this forever, because that's not the best value of that trade that I'm making with the company, because I'm taking a lot out of the company. So I'm going to find somebody else to do that job, then I'm going to come over here. And as the, build, the company gets bigger, you get this, this mass of people on the front lines that are driving towards a goal every day. And then the next set of people who have been there for a little bit longer, they're a little bit further back. And then the people who have been there for a little bit longer are a little bit further back. And so that's how I think about leading uh, from behind. And just I, I got to look at my notes, because I'm going to get all muddled up in my head on things. But the the. The reason that this is important specifically in our, uh, in our domain, and there's a lot, of, a lot of relevance to many, many different problems, whether you're building a factory to, to where, where's Rob? I don't know if he's even here, down the hall, to, to make glass. No, the other Rob. Um, <laughs> the Glavel guys. They're building a factory to make this insulative glass, to put underneath foundations, and, and, and make buildings more sustainable. It's great. There's a lot of moving parts in there. And everybody loves to attach this idea of this, like, singular wizard genius that's out in the front making all the calls. And no person in their right mind would ever really believe, when you think about it, that somebody can understand all the systems and subsystems and interdependencies in a business that has a formidable goal in solo. And they become the adjudicator of good ideas or the creator of good things. 
it's a whole lot of small little inventions that have to come up on a daily basis, whether you're trying to solve receiving an accounts payable or a technical hurdle or whatever. It's a whole lot of small inventions to create something super meaningful. And, and the people on the front lines that have the most information about those problems have to be making the first pass attempt at getting those done. And then they can lean back and say, look, I'm in a, there's a big friction point here. I need some help getting through this. And, uh, and just that simple recognition that, that you know, the, I, I, don't, I don't have a great example, but pick like a, an iPhone or something. An iPhone, I can assure you, was not the singular vision of a single engineer who knew all the things about the hardware and the software and the whatever. It was a whole team of people and a whole lot of geniuses that put their shit together to come up with the product. But they knew what they were going after at the end. And, and it's a subtle but really important differentiator. Let me see if this goes here. We made a new kind of airplane, broke a record for the heaviest electric aircraft to fly, and we did all of that in 10 months. And a lot of it was because, let's make it, try it, do it, break it, and do it again. It's a little out of sequence, but that's our, that's our first aircraft. That's Lino, whose voice was back there, and the group of people that put that together as a team. So this is our latest aircraft. And I, I guess I'll just finish up by saying that um, when, when we think about the, uh, the concept of building an organization for innovation, we're not building the innovation. We're building an environment to innovate in. We're empowering the people to get out to the front, of the, the front lines, solve the problems, and tell one more quick story. I was working at a power electronics company over here in town. And I went out to negotiate a pretty big deal. It was, for me, it was a big deal. It was a few million bucks. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I talked to the president of the company, and I went through all the logic behind the pricing that I was going to do, and you go into the negotiation. And we've all been to the car dealership where the salesman has to go and ask the manager and go and ask the manager. And it's like, it, I, it's, it must be really painful for that salesman, for one thing, because he's got like no power or he wants to play the game and maximize things and coach and trained into this thing. I remember the president said, look, you're on the front lines. You make the decision. You're out there. But just be accountable to your decision, right? And, and it was like this. All of a sudden, you're like, oh, shit. Now, I don't get to lean on you, which means i got to really think and prepare. So from his vantage point, he's probably like thinking, oh, I'm going to get a lot more out of this Clark kid. He's, he's going to think really hard because you can be accountable to this after, afterwards. But at the time, and still now, I think it was a great strategy to send you out there, figure it out on your own. And of course, you're going to lean on people when you need it. But that subtle empowerment, building that environment of innovation, of knowing that people can make decisions, move forward. And, and, and as a business, just to be clear about moving forward and making decisions, we're building airplanes. We screw that up, somebody dies. We know that. Of course. There's one-way doors and there's two-way doors. That's a one-way door. So certain decisions that fall into that bucket of somebody getting hurt versus decisions that you can walk back on are made very differently. And, and there's a lot more cycles that happen before anybody walks away here thinking that we're like a software company and we just break things all the time. That a, lot more th a lot more cycles, and people know that, and we talk about that. So people are thinking, all right, I'm about to make a decision. Is there going to be a financial penalty if I'm wrong? Is there going to be a safety penalty? Is there going to be a material penalty or a delay? OK, what bucket is that in? Well, everything but safety fits into that bucket of a two-way door. Because if you spend a little bit much money or you take a little extra time, but with the information you have the time, you made a decision thinking about your trade with the company, then we're going to stand behind the decision. And that's how you, in my opinion, lead from behind and create a, uh, a culture of innovation. And that's what we're trying to do at Beta. We're not perfect. We're trying to get better every day. So I think that's all I got, unless anybody wants to hear about other parts of the business. and. Russ, you're going to be my MC, so I don't have to. Awesome. Wow. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I got lost in some of the science stuff, but the, the rest of it is amazing. Um, it's easy to see how Kyle leads from behind so well because he's like six foot seven, and he can still see the whole room even if he's standing in the back. Um, I told you you're a comedian. I've told him before. <laughs> it's my weapon. Uh, I would love to hear any questions that anybody has. This again, this is a rare opportunity. I, you, all of you have heard me tell stories about Kyle and Beta and everything that's going on there. Um, we're lucky to have him here. Got a question in the back. Yeah, so you talk a lot about taking steps backwards as you empower more people. How do you stay excited when you're trying to do something further back? Are you staying focused or just like excited that other people are doing it for you and now you can hang out with Russ after? 
Yeah. Yeah. That's nice. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, he didn't make it down to Puerto Rico just for the, well, it was, but we're trying to get him down there again. But yeah, good question. Um, so the, the, the way that I've thought about it, it's a great question, by the way. Um, you know, when we started the business and there was one of us, then two of us, then eight of us, like you were kind of doing everything on the front lines of everything, doing the accounting over here, doing some engineering over here, some sales over here. Um, as we grew the business and we, we started to get really, really smart people, people that are way smarter than me in all these different disciplines, I felt like I had the right to, to stay attached to a couple of them. And the things that I think that I can contribute to the business most are. And, and that's around you know, the aviation-specific flying things, some of the engineering elements, a little bit of the, the sales, and maybe to the annoyance of the people that are on the front lines there, I pop up to the front lines and I try to run alongside them and figure stuff out. And, uh, and so over here in other areas that like I, I'm just way outmatched, and I used to just muddle through like accounting and, and finance and stuff. I, I don't touch it at all. And I just trust that the best people in the world are working on that. And, and I'm able to, to fit ba sit back here and sometimes ask annoying questions. But, but I, I feel like the, the best thing to do is not to get way back here and go off to Puerto Rico and just kind of manage. That's not, that's not reality. I'm excited about what we're doing. And I pop up to the front lines and go and fly the plane or go and do some engineering, or sit in on some, some sales meetings. And, uh, and to the extent possible, with just with the, the limits of time, try and do that to the best benefit of the company while it's still fun. Because if it's not fun, you don't work quite as hard. Does it make sense? Oh. Yeah. Um, you said that the way that you kind of inspire confidence and do marketing and raise resources by, by pointing, like, look what we're doing look what we've done. Just because I don't know the early story, I'm curious, like, at the very beginning, when all you really have is a story and you haven't done anything, yeah. um, how you were able to navigate that space, raise the capital that you needed to do the things and speak to the questions that you didn't have any answers for because you hadn't thought about it yet. Yeah, it's a great question. In fact, when I was listening to Russ talk before, I was thinking back to the beginning of our business where the investments into our business, I think we're 50-50 philanthropic and maybe a slight hope that we could do something commercially viable. And there's some, some local and probably inappropriate for me to name, name them investors that stepped up and, I, of course, it was on a story. It was, look, we, we, we have, in this story I've been trying to tell for a long time, in different forms, from way back from my, my, my this was my senior thesis at college, uh, Beta Air, which had a different form, had a slightly different flavor to it. And then I met somebody, Martine Rothblatt, who had a very specific commercial purpose and just kind of bent some of the ideas into something that could be a commercially viable thing. She believed in the story, but she wasn't, she wasn't investing in the company, she was a customer. And so we naturally, to grow and get ahead of a customer, we needed investment locally. And uh, went and pitched a whole bunch of people, some of them in this room, and they wrote checks into the company, um, both while working in the company and external as kind of fans. And those were semi-philanthropic checks. And there's one in particular who wrote a meaningful check, and he said, here, I'm going to be gone when this money comes out. So you find the next company to put this in when it comes back out. And I thought that was super meaningful. And, it, and by the way, it's another little like empowerment hack. Because you're sitting there not thinking, oh, well, I'm going to make a rich guy richer. No, no, he's doing this because he cares about putting into a, the next meaningful business. And all of a sudden, it becomes even more important than what I'm trying to do, because the next guy's dependent on me. <laughs> and, uh, and so that philanthropic kind of gap um, would not have been filled unless we had a very clear mission and purpose as a business. If we were off trying to do financial trades in the oil and gas sector, I can assure you we wouldn't have gotten the same investments. So that's how we filled the gap. I think having a purpose, having good people that believed in what we were doing, um, caring a whole hell of a lot. And people could read that, that, that the team was, was really like passionate about what we were doing. It wasn't with spreadsheets and charts. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, um, Peter. All right, wait for me though, bud. You need the microphone. All right, I love what you said about you know empowering people, and I guess I'll use the hill, right? The front lines, charging up the hill. 
And, you know, traditionally people think about a business as maybe more of a pyramid, right, with the leader at the top and then the people are at the bottom doing all the work, the front lines, as you call them. So I'm just wondering if you could speak to the management layer. The how, do you, how do you manage that management layer um, to, to help push the people up the hill? What's, what's that look like? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so it's interesting because when I, when I talk about a flat organization or leading from behind or any of these concepts, it doesn't mean that there isn't a structure. And it's not just a willy-nilly, everybody runs into work every day and says, oh, what am I going to do? It's, they, they, they have a clear direction. And, and people that haven't been saturated by the problem for very long, or they're slower learners like me, you have, you have to like, like find people that will give you guidance. We have a board. They give me guidance. We have a bunch of managers. We don't call them managers generally, but they give other people guidance. Um, but the, the subtle difference is that they're willing to do any of the jobs that people that work for them would do, and the jobs that are on the next level or whatever, and they have to prove that. And they have to go and pick up the pieces over here and get down and finish that job and then bring it back up. And, and so this leading from behind, again, doesn't mean that there's not you know, we have 60 interns coming in. They, they need direction, right? They need direction on, on identifying the goal and then coaching into boundaries. And like Nelson Mandela had a famous quote about being a, a leader is a shepherd, not, not standing out front and saying, follow me. The, the sheep don't follow the shepherd. The shepherd stands behind the sheep and moves them around. And that's a shitty analogy because you don't want to think of people as sheep, right? But, they, 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 it, it, but it, 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 it makes a little bit of sense when you, when, when you think about what, what you need to do to just kind of prod in a particular direction. Say, oh, no, no, let me clarify that for you. We're going after that goal. That's the mountain we're taking. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question, but it's, uh, there is certainly a management structure, um, but most certainly the attitude of the management is I'm willing and able to do any of those jobs, and I'm going to prove it to you that I'll do these jobs by doing these jobs. And you wouldn't find anybody in our business that, that says, oh, that's not for me. Anybody else? We got some more. Chuck Patterson in the house. Oh God! All right, Chuck. Here you go. Well, this this isn't really a question. I just want to reiterate on that. Um, as an employee of Beta, um, I have to say that it is one of the best places to work because it is a team environment. Doesn't matter management or the person that's you know cleaning up midnight. It's um, it's very impressive, and I've you know. I'm not a scientist, I'm not an engineer, but the stuff that we do, everyone pretty much you know, helps out. And uh, you got Kyle there, you got everybody. And uh, I have to say, it's an impressive place. You're always inspired to come in every day. Many times we're working 10, 12 hour days, you don't even think about it, you know, and you're stoked to come back in the morning. So it's a great place and uh, very stoked to be there. Thanks. Here we, here we go, in the back. What would you say is the way that you keep your team connected and engaged? Um, so there's a whole lot of tools to keep people connected and engaged. Or most effective. Yeah, so, so the start with the connected part, right? Connected to the mission is something that I also feel very passionate about. And our mission of sustainability and aviation and pushing technology's boundaries um, is initially created by an environment that allows people to do that. And that's a physical space that they're in. And if anybody's been to our hangar, it's designed as a horseshoe around the research and development hangar with glass where every single person can see the product all the time. There's no dark holes or whatever. And the, uh, all, the, all the cubicles have glass in them and the offices have glass. So there's a connection between people, so they generate an empathy for each other. So you don't have these technological, we call interface control documents, that define the communication between brakes and wheels, or between controls and hardware, or whatever. They see each other physically. We don't write those documents in a way that holds people up from creating mechatronic devices, which means using you know, two functions in the same space and time, which is, by the way, the lightest way to build an aircraft, right? Because you've got some one thing doing two things and the other thing stays on the ground. It's a really neat way to solve those problems. So 
keeping people empathetic to each other by seeing each other. And that's like a provable total thing. Empathetic and understanding the product by seeing the product. And then we have a couple little hackery things where we, we, we have a whole lot of airplanes. People say we just have a kind of an airplane addiction, but they're there specifically so people see how, how the mechanics work on other people's airplanes and how easy it is to pull things out. And they're busting their knuckles here. They're spending three hours pulling that engine. And by the way, that helicopter, the engine came in and out in one day. And the engine's like, oh, how did they do that? And they walk down there and they understand it. So it's a real connection to the product and the mission through that physical space. We have this, and everybody's using Slack, everybody's using G Drive, but the, the transparency and the encouragement. I get these reports every week that say, how many public messages, how many private messages? Who's the top private messenger? And they get over and get a little, it's not okay. There, you do things in public, people will come to you with solutions. You do them in private, you better be damn smart, right? Because you've got to solve all the problems yourself. And so we try and get people to do things in public to the extent possible, do things in a transparent way, Stay connected to each other, stay connected to the mission. And you had a second question, but I forget what it was. No. No, it was, it was mainly around connection and keeping them engaged. And yeah. I think that answers both. I think the, the, we, we get to cheat on the engagement. Um, the, 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 the constant like understanding what our goals are, the, the, the exposure of the successes that we have, the other thing that we do, and this is just like part of those passions, when you have a passion about something, you don't, you don't care about engagement. Like, you don't, it doesn't even cross your mind, right? Because that's what I care about. And so every single person in beta is offered flight lessons. So we have um, two, 300 people in flight school right now, and a bunch of people that have gone through and got their pilot's license, and they fly on the weekends. It's a source of pride to their families and their kids and their whatever. We've got too many airplanes, I think. We have 20-something odd airplanes that people just go and take. And, and Katie and I were just talking on the way over here, and they said, oh, did you hear Bob just flew, flew down to Florida with Jared? And they just jumped in a plane, and they flew to Florida, because they felt like doing it, right? They, they're not going to be not engaged in designing the next, the next piece of aviation. Um, and, and so, I mean, that's, and, and you know, one of the things that, and this is kind of taking a step back with that example, is I have gotten and still continue to get a lot of pressure about those types of programs because they're like, geez, you're wasting a lot of money on those things. And, and you ask about engagement, and it's, we spend about 3% of our total cost of employees on those types of programs, on flight lessons. We have, a, 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 we have lunch at, at Beta, and we've got some other neat things, going parties at Hula regularly. And uh, that 3%, if you walked around to the company and gave everybody a 3% bonus, you say, stay engaged, they're like, sweet. What? What was that word you used? I can't remember. Like 30 seconds later, right? And so the, 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 that little hackery of finding that thing that's going to get people passionate about it, recognizing the cost benefit, and then just saying, screw you all who don't understand it. We're going to go after this. And if you don't believe us now, on the next round, you're going to believe us. Awesome. Thank you. Everybody ready Ooh, here for we go. PR? Here we go. Oh. Almost. We got some more questions. A lot of curiosity in the room. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I, I really appreciate uh, you sharing and your commitment to servant leadership and empowering and enabling your frontline is phenomenal. As your frontline starts making more and more decisions and you've empowered them more, if their decisions start to shape the vision of your organization, is that organic and how the organization evolves, or should the leader then step in and adjust course? Yeah, no, I think it would be, so first of all, yes, it is organic, and it's how the organization evolves. No different than technological innovation. The, the, the objectives and missions of the company will change as a function of the company. I'm not the company, right? It's all the people in the company. And, and naturally, we're going to hotly debate things, and people are going to come together and whatever. Um, Sometimes there'll be a louder voice over here or somebody that has a little more insight, and that kind of gets a couple more votes, and we, we, we move that, uh, that forward a, as a whole. I, I don't think at all the leader should step in and say, oh, you all are wrong, and we're going that way, right? Especially if, if, if I mean, you have to listen. You have to walk into the meeting and assume you're wrong. And I had something else to say, but I forget the other part of your, um, I have a short-term memory. We all done for a Friday night? Oh, Sarah's got Ooh, one. Sarah's got one. 
Sarah was my co-pilot back from Oshkosh this year. Yeah, that was that was super fun. Um, so when you're creating a vision for the company, like you're saying, this is the mountain that we're climbing. Are you looking at like a certain type of product that you're creating? Like it's going to be the best electric aircraft or is it like where are we going in the next hundred thousand years in the future? Or is it a 10 year goal? Like where where do you look to and how do you get people to go towards that vision? Yeah, yeah, good. good. It, it's a good, insightful question because um, achieving those goals by definition kind of leaves you looking around and say, what next, right? Um, so one of the ways that we think about that is, is here's our near-term goal. And we, we tend not to put a lot of schedules and Gantt charts together. We just say, here's the sequence of events that are going to achieve that goal. And then if we said, this is our goal this year, that's the pinnacle we're trying to climb. And then we define, what's our goal next year? Or pick a quarter, a year, a day, whatever it is. And lay that out as a mountain range of things that we have to get after. And, and, and it's endless. Like, yes, we want to be around in 100 years. We want to build a company, not an airplane. And, and so the first step in doing that is keeping your promise of getting to that first goal. And then we got to, by the way, run after something called a type certification, which is an FAA conformance that allows you to sell the planes into commercial applications. And then we got to run after a production certification. And then we got to do our next airplane. And then we got to do, deploy a charging network over the entire United States. So those, those types of things, and on each of those steps, we got to dissect them in a similar way. Of course, some of them are strictly technical with Mother Nature and physics. Others are within the regulatory framework that our, that our country has as the FAA, for example, by things like physics and technology. And then you have a three-way kind of a, equation to try and figure out what the, what the maximum maximum we can achieve on a certified aircraft is. And then you go to the next mountain. So, uh, yeah, that's, there's no question that, that like it's a whole sequence and, and multiple, multiple different goals, and there's a lot of redefinition of that. It's, and, and, you know, reality checks, too, that like, like I said, 75% reality and like 25% aspirational, and that means that, that some of those goals you're going to miss, and then you have to say, okay, which one do I prioritize more, or some of those specs you're going to miss, or whatever. The, the only experience that I've had with your company was a tech jam, and you had um, a demo model out in the parking lot. And so I had a tech friend with me, and we were talking pie in the sky with your engineers about, oh, like, you know, this, the sky's the limit, literally. And it was so interesting that there were two engineers, I don't remember their names, but they had this quiet confidence and clarity, and they said basically, yeah, those all sound great, but we're focusing on XY certification right now. So just what you talked about, I saw in action that, oh, that's good to hear. that even when they were in this, you know, sort of uh, expansive tech jam environment, their focus came through really clearly so that I could see that they yeah. live that. Well, I get a chill when you say it because it's really important. And I think that we, we talk about this in the company as well, that Focus is rewarded, like the 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 feature creep or whatever other things are just like. In the case of our specific product, we said, where can we make the biggest dent on the climate? It turns out it's in shipping and logistics. So people come to us all the time, and they're like, oh, you can put a super quiet, stealthy, like tactical fighter into the back door of bad guys, or you can you can ship people in and out of the city, or you can go and you can do shark patrol along the beach so Russ doesn't get eaten while he's, shark, while he's surfing, right? All these different things, and it's a slightly different specification. I know, you're a good surfer. You're up before they get to you. No, we, we learned there are no more sharks. We learned that yesterday. So oh. the, the, threat, the threat is not that real anymore. <laughs> the, uh, but the point is that that, that focus, and if, if, if everybody's pulling in the same direction, and again, you could argue, well, we're going to hedge here, we're going to hedge here, but if, 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 if we're in a tug-of-war game with Mother Nature here, and I'm pulling five degrees off, I'm pulling one degree off, right? It's, that's pretty good. I'm pretty well aligned with the rope. I'm pulling 90 degrees off, I'm doing no work at all. 45 degrees off, I'm using 0.7 of what, what would come this way. So we want everybody pulling in the exact same direction. And, and if we define where we're going, then, uh, then, then we get that, and that's what we mean by focus is rewarded. And I, I'm thrilled that they said that to you, because we, you have people all the time that comes up, and by the way, if enough people come in and say, you should be pulling in this direction, 
Guess what? Everybody take a step over here and start pulling in this direction. You know what I mean? But thank you for bringing that up. I, I think ultimately it comes down to company. It's company culture at the end of the day. And you guys are building, obviously, one of the most complicated pieces of machinery that has never been done before. You're doing it for the first time ever. You've got an enormous team. I think what everyone's basically saying is these challenges are incredible, particularly when you're trying to stay focused across a team of hundreds of different people that show up every single day with literally a pretty flat management style across the company. It is, it's, it's, it's mesmerizing. It's, it's incredible. There are, there are, it's hard to describe just how incredibly efficient that team seems to be under the guidance. But, and you need leadership. You need guidance. You need leadership. You need a visionary that everybody really feels comfortable in front of or behind or in front of. But essentially, I think, I think we'd all agree, Kyle. I think um, you, you're a captivating person. You're, you're someone that people can honestly really share the vision of what you're doing. They feel incredibly passionate and motivated by what you're trying to do and what you're trying to accomplish. It's, it's an incredible goal. It's a, an incredible challenge. And um, it's just amazing to have it happening all right here in Burlington, Vermont. And thank you again for doing that and making it happen here. So thanks for us. That's it, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you.